thank you enormously for for taking the time and and for being a part of um, this this crazy experiment that um, that we're uh, that we're doing with Club Divin. Um, but in in terms of and and you know feel free to to take this one whichever direction you want. But but really, what got you into into the wine world? Um, and and how much did did community or mentors and role models have to do with that? And I'm I'm partly seeding the question we'll get to later, which is um, how that's changed for you as you've gone through your career, particularly as a female professional in the wine world, and how you've experienced that. But let, let's start with question one, which is how you got into to this whole crazy wine world as a non-French woman now living in Bordeaux and, and being an expert in the region, and, and we can take it from there. Okay, so I um, I I have had other jobs out of wine. So I think there are probably are kind of two kinds of people who are working in wine and certainly wine writers. Some who have got into wine writing through a passion for wine, and mm -hmm. that has really been their route in. So my route in is, was not that in the same way. I was a writer before. So when I graduated, I went to um, Asia for like five years. I lived in Japan for one year and then Hong Kong for about three years. And I was a, a, a journalist working for the South China Morning Post, for the Eastern Express, for a, a travel magazine for a long time while I was in Hong Kong with a guy who was without a doubt my first mentor who's a guy called David Keaton, who um, now heads up, who started a company that's called Clo Quo Global, which kind of does an awful lot of work actually with Bhutan, which I know you guys do some work with. He does a lot of strategy work for UNESCO, for governments, and also in the hospitality industry. And he was a huge influence on me in terms of my writing and just generally my approach to, 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 to journalism and, and all the rest of it. And it was only later that wine became a key part of, of my life. And it really kicked off in 1996. I went to South Africa on a trip. I was on my own. I spent three months going through South Africa, well, through Africa as a whole. And I spent about two weeks in the vineyards around Stellenbosch. And it was just after apartheid. So it was just after the country had opened up. And I met a guy called um, Jabulani, who was the first black manager of Spear at the time. He, he'd been, during apartheid, he'd moved to New York and he was living, um, working with Acker and Merrill. And then when apartheid lifted, he came back to South Africa and wanted to be part of that, you know, opening up of the country. That was, there was so much optimism at the time of what could happen in South Africa. And I met him and I wrote about him as a writer, not as a wine journalist, but I, really started to feel the magic of what wine can bring together in terms of you know the politics and the history and the emotions and you couldn't be in South Africa at that time I don't think without it having some fundamental impact on how you looked at the world it was really a really important part of, of for me and um anyway so that and getting to know the vineyards there I started thinking about wine in a deeper level than I had before and at the same time, I came back to the UK just after that and started, lived in London when the, where the whole kind of restaurant scene and, and getting to know lots of chefs and, and sommeliers in London. And the more I got to know the wine world, the more I became interested in it. But I was always coming, first of all, from the point of view of a journalist and a writer, seeking out the stories, trying to understand why wine was the way it was. And when I moved to Bordeaux in 2003, I was not intending to make it my full-time career, but I quickly realized when I was here just how lucky I was really to have landed in Bordeaux in 2003. I mean, we're gonna talk about the changes in the wine world, but I was really here at a point where it was still in the Parker era. There was still lots of kind of big wines, lots of um, kind of, you know, big fruits, big alcohols, etc. But I lived very quickly through a big change in terms of how wines were made, the climate changing. You had the Chinese coming in at that time, Hong Kong collectors, like five years later. There was an awful lot happening in Bordeaux within those years. And I got hooked. Honestly, the truth is I got hooked on it. I'd been much more of an Italian wine lover before moving to, um, to Bordeaux, but when I got here, I just quickly realized the whole world is contained within Bordeaux wines, past, present, future. And it um, 
became more and more interesting. And that was when I decided to take, take it seriously and started studying wine. So doing the WSET, I did a tasting diploma that's like a year long tasting diploma with the Institute of Enology here in Bordeaux. And yeah, and here I am now, 20 years later, and I've written probably six books about Bordeaux and it is now without doubt my main occupation. Uh, sometimes things work out the way they're supposed to, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, and I, I'd love to get to your, to your latest book, and we'll talk about that at the end when we talk about the club and NFPs and tech and, and that, that bit. But why don't we seg into those changes that, that you were talking about? Um, I mean, arguably, sort of just before you arrived was was when wine prices started to explode, right? Around the 2000, the mythical 2000 vintage, which, which kind of, you know, saw, saw prices at a, a even radically different level. And the debate was, will it ever stop? I mean, three being, you know, arguably a bit of a weaker vintage, but the prices just kept going. Um, but it's not just about price, right? I mean, I've, I've two decades of, I think not only Bordeaux as a city, but but the winemaking in and around Bordeaux, and and particularly the influences from 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 Burgundy and other winemaking regions, and how vinification, and particularly viticulture, is is done, have been have been some of the hallmarks, no doubt. But how do you how do you frame it in your head? Because you know, as a as a journalist, uh, I I know you're you're one to think in in structures. So I'd I'd love to hear your um, your model for for thinking about how Bordeaux in particular has changed. And if you want to comment on other regions, feel free, of course. I'm going to start you off with a couple of figures because I happen to just be doing some research on those years from 2000 to 2009 and how they performed on the secondary market as investments. Hmm. So That's I've been speaking to Libex, the, the, the guys in London. Yeah. And of, the, of those vintages, 2000 to 2009, 2009 is by far the most traded. It's like nearly 12% of all of the trade of those years, but it is not the one that you were most sensible to invest in. The one that you would have made the most money from, and you just mentioned it, was the 2000 vintage. And on average, this is taking the price of the top 500 wines of Bordeaux in 2000. I'm gonna ask you to guess how much do you think it's gone up? <laughs> how much do you think your average price rise would have been between the year 2000 buying on Prima and today? The average price average rise, price. average annual price rise? Between now and then, sorry, between then and now. Yeah, it, 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 it's easier for me to, to think in, uh, in, in, in annuals. Um, if I recall correctly, the 2000 Premier campaign, let's say for the tops was around 300, three something. I mean, they, they were expensive at the time, no question. Yeah. They, were, they were at levels that we hadn't seen before. Right, exactly. Um, so, and now the tops are probably about 3x that. Um, okay, I'm, I'm liking your approach to this. <laughs> so I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm a former <laughs> consultant, so I, 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 have to, I have to go mathematical modeling. Um, the the and i'm now what i'm wondering is if the rest went up more than the first growth because i always I, not not being a bordeaux expert um like yourself i i can only remember sort of basically the ones that i love and and the first growth so if the first growth did 3x in 20 years um that would have been like uh not much more than 12 percent ish number so the other ones i'm guessing had to be higher mm -hmm. uh so i I'd, I'd have to guess 15. okay Just, you want to know uh, how much the price rise on average from 2000 to now 653 percent that is your average price rise taking over the top uh, taking 500 wines what? Not annual, not <laughs> annual. No, no, not annual. That's from then to now. Okay, no, so that was, that was my okay. annual. So I had 3x, okay. which uh, which would have been about half the figure okay. that you got. So, I mean, so that's Latour not would have been 3x, would have, would okay. have been would have been 300%. So then, yeah, so yeah, so it, that's higher. That's not higher bad. than I would have and this And the second best one was 2001, which has gone up about almost 400%. 
three nine three. That does seven. not surprise me. Yeah. Do you believe in that? Um, well, I guess it's it's a fact. I guess it's not a matter of, but it's interesting that you have those amazing year couplings that that sort of happen, you know, almost every decade where one year just because of ratings outshines, but the year next to it, which turns out to be sort of almost as good, always gets shorter shrift, like 89, 90, um, uh, 2000, 2001, some, some would say 82, 83 should have been one of those pairings, whatever. It's, uh, it's funny how that phenomena, you, you have that sort of just after you get value and then the secondary market, of course, you know, ends up correcting it, but you, you do tend to have some time. So I imagine that if you bought 2001 sort of within the first five oh, yeah. years, you'd have got amazing you'd have done much better. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And that's often, I often try and think why, why does Bordeaux keep this grip on the imagination, even after so many frustrations there's so many things that we all hate about Bordeaux the Bordeaux system you know all, there's so much that kind of doesn't work in today's wine world and yet it keeps this grip and one of the reasons I think is exactly that that they have well there's so many things to argue about with Bordeaux and you might get like you know do you prefer 82 or 83 do you prefer 89 or 90 um do you prefer left bank or right bank are you Cabernet or Merlot are you Lafitte or Latour there are all of these kind of oppositions all over Bordeaux that are kind of easy to grab hold of and to talk about and to understand and yet reveal lots of complexities about the region behind them. So should we start subsections of the club, sort of the, the 83 <laughs> lovers versus the 82 <laughs> fan people? I think that might say a lot about people. I'm, I'm an unashamed 83 fan. I, I'm, I'm just, <laughs> I don't love 82 that much or nearly as much as uh, but I also always root for the underdog as well. That's just my yep. personality. So yeah, yeah, me too, me too. <laughs> so yes, yeah, so, I mean, so that's it's kind of it's kind of fun. And so definitely, I came in at that point. You're right. When suddenly prices were starting to explode, but that was also the time when Burgundy. We said let's talk about other regions as well. Those years from 2000 to 2009 was really when Burgundy suddenly exploded as well on the secondary market mm. and became much more of a serious contender to Bordeaux in the investment world than it had been probably Absolutely. at any point up to that date. And all and of this, I would say, is reflecting all kinds of yeah other stuff that was happening in Bordeaux at the time. It was really a shift from old to new and the changing environment comes into it. So it's easy for us now to look back and say, oh, how ridiculous for them to use so much new oak, how ridiculous to push ripeness. But of course it wasn't ridiculous at the time. It was very, mm -hmm. very smart. And um, Parker and Michelle Rowland were doing something which was desperately needed, which was to stop this kind of slightly underripe green pepper. Everything mm -hmm. had to, you had to wait 20 years for things to soften because the tannins were too tough. All of that stuff was a reality of Bordeaux for most of the 20th century. And so when Roland came along and Parker was like, cool, that's, I, I like what you're doing, that was hugely important. But by the time I arrived, people who were still using those same techniques were actually ending up with wines that just didn't taste as good as they should do, in my opinion. And so you have quite a few wines in those years which have not lasted as well as they should and have kind of, you know, just have too much oak. And so I've been lucky enough from my own personal taste to see that shift back. But it isn't just about fashion, it's also about the fact that the environment has changed and so we need to make those changes. So let's talk about that a little because I, I think Bordeaux is not the only place where that happened. And, um, and, and you look in other winemaking regions and you do see kind of these periods of stylistic change. And I think the critics, whoever they are, they do have a lot to do with that. There may not be, one 800 pound sort of gorilla like like Parker uh, in Bordeaux, but you know that they whether it's a collective or whatever it is that that influence is undeniable. But to some extent, and you can argue whether it's causal or correlated, but um, there to some extent the voice of the critics also reflects the voice of the public if if they're doing their jobs right. So, but you you mentioned specifically climate. Um, we talked about pricing, we talked about sort of the reviewers, but what are, what are some of the, the external, the more exogenous factors that you think have driven, driven some of this change? Because climate's certainly uh, an important one that everybody is increasingly concerned about. Mm -hmm. And I guess 
there's been an increased recognition of um, it's connected to climate, but not just connected to climate. The, 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 the need to not just treat the environment better, but to treat staff better, to have this whole idea of the ecosystem of the vineyard to be more sustainable over the long term. And interestingly in Bordeaux, one of the things that I like about Bordeaux from a point of view of a writer is it's, it is so cyclical and you can look back in history and you can see so much that influences the way things are done today or that should be done today. So in the 17th, 18th century, a lot of the Bordeaux estates would have been set up like villages where they would have had you know, whole, the whole team living there. A lot, of the first, a lot of the first schools in Bordeaux were set up by the chateaus, yeah. a lot of the first hospitals, a lot of the first healthcare programs, all of that kind of stuff. Then yeah. that all got sent to one side. And there is now this shift back towards, you can't just claim to be treating your vineyards organically and then treating your staff badly there's yeah. you know you have to it has to be taken in everything has to be taken into control into consideration and you're you are seeing that shift now as the younger generation come in and just as the Bordelais might be frustrating at times but they are very good at seeing what's happening in the wider world and reacting to it and and evolving I mean if the if one thing you can say about the Bordelais is they are survivors and one of the reasons that they're so good at surviving is because they are more than capable of seeing what needs to be done and changing. So let's talk about that globalization factor, because you're right. Bordeaux has been a global trade center for a long, long time and arguably, you know, the first you know, export market for wine since the Romans were shipping it around their empire um, on, on their, their wonderful roads. So. And I think you're right that traders are survivors, right? But the, there's, even if you go to the city of Bordeaux, I mean, the first time I visited 20 whatever years ago, it's dramatically different. The modernization of Bordeaux and Bordeaux as a tourism center, has that all gone hand in hand to opening the mind a little? Because you can be a great trader in your, in your That's ivory an interesting question. It's so, I mean, I um, don't think I could have lived here for as long as I have if, if the Bordeaux city hadn't undergone that. Because having lived, you know, I lived in Hong Kong, I lived in Tokyo, I lived in, in London. If it was, thank goodness, when I came to Bordeaux, it was going through that evolution. It's still tiny, 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 small town compared to any of those things. But at least there is a feeling that it's outward looking and increasingly international. But as you say, that's been true throughout history. I think for a long time, 70s, 80s, 90s, it was very, dark, insular, it wasn't welcoming to the outside world. And that that is definitely changing and evolving. Um, to speak to that in terms of wine, I would say over the last five years, a big change in a positive way for Bordeaux has been selling more and more Napa wines, Australian mm. wines, Sonoma wines, you know, wine, Spanish now, wines from around the world. And that is reflective, I would say, yes, of this kind of evolution that Bordeaux has gone through of not just trading, but realizing they have to put a face to it in terms of the city itself being more open, having more hotels, more restaurants, all that kind of thing. And it's definitely- And wine bars and that wine don't bar. just serve Bordeaux. Exactly, God, thank God as well. I mean, honestly, yeah, that's great. I remember probably 10 years ago, tasting uh, with Thomas de Roux, uh, for the first time in Pomer, and he blinded, he loves blinding, you know, cool things and making you guess and it was a it was a white tononia that they blinded us on and Toma obviously had had, had um had been the winemaker had, had been in Ornalaya before and so he had a broader wine experience and wasn't native Bordelais but at the time and this was only 10 years ago nobody else would have blind you know no one running uh, uh, one of the top chateaus would have blinded you anything other than Bordeaux much less you know, had a full lunch with non many non-Bordeaux wines. And so really the, the most of that change has been relatively recent, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And now you might just be lucky enough, you go to Carmé Brion, you'll get sent, you'll be so beer before you sit down. You know, I mean, people, there is it's much more of an openness, but I think that's driven by the people working in the estates, not necessarily by the owners. It's driven by the guys mm. who are working there, like Toma, um, who have lived in Italy or have lived in California or whatever, and they don't want to give it up. They don't want to come back here and be back to 
only Bordeaux, only Bordeaux, only, and what everybody who cares about wine knows, <laughs> there's great wine everywhere and you can learn so much. It's all about exchange and learning. Exactly. I mean, as you said right at the beginning, community. Community is about exchange and um, and what you know, what you can, what you, how you can help and grow from each other. I think it's it's interesting that you point that out. I I, I probably had not thought about that um, as a strong a factor as it is, but I think you're right. I think I think that globalization and movement of labor, including not just the winemaker, but the entire team being yeah. much more international and rotating through you know much like much like the restaurant world over the last 30 years has experienced with people going all over the world from star kitchen to star kitchen and, and getting those influences and, and spreading them um i, think I that love that i love that up. you make that comparison because that's exactly right but like most of the children of the great estates of bordeaux have gone to work in you know with them um, i don't know lefleur in burgundy or whatever they're all there's such an exchange going on between them and it has been true throughout history that the Bordelais have sent their children out but what you found over the last two decades is exactly that the great wines of the world have also they've been sending their children over to Bordeaux and there is a true exchange between the regions. Has the ownership thing influenced that as well do you think like I mean we, we were the funny thing is as I said that I was thinking you know, we, we say Palmer, but Palmer was Palmer, of course, when uh, it was it the Colonel, <laughs> the Colonel bought it, whatever, <laughs> in, in the 1800s. Um, so I, as I was saying it, I'm wondering if, if it's correct or not, but maybe you can get those figures or have those figures. And as as globalization of ownership, as, as, as vineyards have become increasingly, you know, these... Um, you know, whether it be vanity projects or investments for the wealthy or whatever it is, has that had an influence that you've seen in your time? If you look throughout the entire history of Bordeaux from the Romans, the dominant economic entity globally have been the people who have been either drinking Bordeaux wines or owning the chateaus of Bordeaux wines. So you can you can just look at this purely from a socioeconomic viewpoint, you can trace who was the top dog globally, internationally, by, or rather globally, by who was buying Lafitte Latour Mouton and who was coming over here and setting up a merchant or a, a broker firm and who was buying the estates. It's a clear line and very, very cool way of looking at Bordeaux. So it's, 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 yes, it's true today, but it's always been true. Excellent. I'm I'm glad someone here is the Bordeaux expert, but uh, also that my instincts weren't totally wrong about that. Oh, they're totally so, right. <laughs> so, is what's the current trend, and what what do you think is coming next on that front? Then, if we look at ownership and let's say dominant export or trade. So, still today, in terms of where do the top wines of Bordeaux go, they're still dominated by going to China. The very first. Chinese owned property was in 2008. So it was a company, I think they were called Long, Long Guy Shading, sorry, Long Guy Trading. And they came and bought a very small property in Entre Deux Mer that was called La Tour Laguens. And I'm sure the fact that half of the name was La Tour had something to do with them buying it. That was a small, uh, uh, it, was, it was a trading company, but it wasn't a big government backed trading company. It was an independent purchase, but that ushered in this incredible, era of about 10 years where you had huge numbers of Chinese owners probably going up to about 150 200 at, at the height mm. but what we've seen in the in the last couple of years especially since President Xi has closed down so much in terms of moving capital out of China the routes to get your finance out of China have closed down a lot so that is in retreat and you've seen things like um, Chateau Luden up in the Medoc which was a 50% joint venture between a big Chinese company and in fact, a Baiju producer, a big Chinese company and a French company. And, the, and it went on the market in a very unusual way about 18 months ago, I don't know if you remember this, but they released a press release saying, we're in financial difficulties, we're having loans called in and because we're based in China, we cannot move our liquidity out of the country. Yeah. We're going to have to sell up and it, so but to do this via a press release was extremely unusual anyway it has only just been sold very recently i think last week to a 
to a company that already owns other properties in Bordeaux, quite a small producer, but still they own like five properties in Bordeaux. So that one has gone. And that is quite, I would say, it's a symptom of you're seeing a lot of those Chinese owned properties that are quietly going back on the market because mm. the owners haven't been able to invest the way they wanted to. But at the same time, I went to see a brilliant project just last week that's, owned, that's called Chateau Plan Point and it's in Fronzac. And that is a big Chinese owned property, still doing brilliantly well and still investing hugely. They bought this one estate and they, in, I can't remember how long ago, maybe 10 years ago. And since then they've probably bought eight or nine all around it. So now it's gonna be the biggest estate in Fronzac, about 150 hectares. And they have an incredible project building a beautiful, beautiful winery that's gonna be the flagship of the region. And I'm sure do very well for Fronzac as a whole because it will increase the interest in that appellation, which, you know, it's doing well because global warming is helping Frontac. It's a lot of limestone soils, mm. was a little bit rustic, but the global warming is helping it to deliver more regular, good quality, right wines. And I think this Chinese project is going to be extremely important for the appellation. So there are two, two sides to it. Well, and I think the, the fact that the Chinese will obviously be thinking about tourism attached with that and Chinese tourism to Chinese owned wineries, I'm, I'm sure is, is uh, something that has already been seen. But, um, you know, Bordeaux sort of in, in all of these famous, famous architect redone Couvry and, uh, and projects at, at the top end has been even more closely connected with luxury tourism and um, the Chinese contributing to cracking that code and figuring out how to make that tourism equation work well, I think is welcome. Because um, there have been a few attempts that have gone, you know, okay at best. Uh, and obviously if you're Chateau Margaux, you can have whoever do your couvre and it doesn't really matter whether it increases tourism greatly or not. But we've we've seen Michelin star restaurants pop up and, and disappear uh, because um, it, it, it one Michelin star restaurant in, in sort of otherwise a place where you would go to, to do some visits and tastings just wasn't enough of a draw. So hopefully. Um, so hopefully that's that an is. interesting point in terms of there's a, the appellation of Sauten with the sweet wines, which you know used to be so popular and now are, are really not. They're hoping, I think, that that idea of restaurants and gastronomy are really going to be a way out for Sauten for the future. And they're all thrilled because just last week, um, La Fauré Perigay got its second Michelin star. And I think the big question is, will that make a difference? Because it had one before, everybody loved the restaurant, but I, I'm not sure it was really drawing enough people to the region as a whole. But will two Michelin stars, will that make the difference? I think, oh no, we, we don't know, it's very new. But I know that there are now a cluster of five or six other restaurant projects in Sauterne that are taking shape. And I guess the hope is that there'll be a critical mass, which will actually make a difference. Let's uh, let's hope that that you know you kind of see the concentric circles. First, it was Bordeaux city itself, and we hope that that development uh, continues on to the to the wine regions around. Um, so let me let me move to that second half that I teed up in the beginning because you've you've now um, been. Uh, doing what you're doing highly successfully for two decades. Obviously, one of the other big topics of conversation over the last couple of years in business in general, uh, but also in the wine world in particular, has been diversity. Um, how have you experienced uh, the changes in, in, in that world? And, and do you see yourself as sort of an advocate and a mentor and, and, and someone who's, who's participating in making that change happen? So I have said several times that a lot of the issues that Bordeaux has is about privilege and access. Mm. It's not necessarily about sexism or any specific, it, it's a lot of it is about the fact that the people who actually can change things in Bordeaux, who move things in Bordeaux, tend to be a very small group of people who have been, who have had power in this region for centuries and it's about economic power, and it's about entrenched power. And that has been, I think, incredibly harmful, no question. It might have got them a long way originally, but it is not helping Bordeaux to be seen to connect to the new generation of people who are drinking wine, 
And anyway, in and of itself, it isn't a healthy situation to not mm. be opening up and getting in new people. Um, I hope, so for a long time, I have certainly written about it and tried to shed light on it. But since um, last year, I quit Decanter. I left Decanter after about 18 years of Decanter. I was their border correspondent, you know, a good gig. If you're, gonna, if you're a wine writer, it's a sweet gig to be border correspondent for Decanter. But I got to the point where I, I felt, I, I'd done, I you know, I was great, but I wanted to do more and I wanted to evolve and keep, you know, keep pushing forward and, and doing all the stuff that, that, we, that is exciting in any career. And so I launched my own site, janeanson.com last October. And right from the start, one of my key things was to be part of that change, to actually be able to help things. So I've done a number of things. The first thing I did was right from the start, setting up I'm 1% for the planet. So 1% of my turnover is going to environmental causes because I, I care about them and that's important to me. But this idea of advocacy and trying to open up Bordeaux of all places was very important. So what I've launched, I just launched it last week, um, is gonna be held at the end of September and it will be every year. This is gonna be an annual week and it's, it's called the Bordeaux Mentor Week. And I am mm. doing this with a friend of mine here who's called Chinedu, who's a Nigerian importer and marketing um, expert. She's super, super dynamic and excellent woman. She's also, I think, president of the French Business Network for Women or something. I mean, she's really, she's, she's fantastic. Wow. Anyway, so I asked her to help me. And what we're doing in year one, it's just for six people, but we hope we'll expand it as we get um, more, hopefully some people to sponsor, more sponsors next year. But anyway, I'm bringing over six people who are working in wine, but at the beginning of their career, they might be, we've had lots of applicants from Puerto Rico. We've had somebody coming, but like four applicants from South Africa. We've had applicants from, um, from Singapore, all, all over. It's really exciting. And what, I, what I'm gonna do is bring them over here. They're gonna be put up in a chateau, in, um, chateau for a week it's during harvest. So they'll be getting hands-on experience with harvest, but also I'm gonna do some tasting with them of older vintages because it's hard to get, it's, it's, it's expensive prohibitively to get good older vintages. So I'm doing that with them. Um, they'll be meeting negotiants, be, be, be meeting startups of across the wine region, just to show them not just the classic roles you can work in with wine, but what else there is. And um, the, the aim is absolutely to try and open up access to people who might think of Bordeaux as being too closed. And really excitingly for me, right at the beginning of this conversation, I said one of my first mentors was this guy called David Keane. And he yep. now is in the position heading up this big um, kind of global marketing and branding agency to, to help. So he's going to sponsor one of the places. For, for, so my first mentor is going to be helping me with this mentor week that I'm setting up. So that's kind of sweet. Continuity, love it. The next generation coming in. I I, I promise uh, anybody listening, I did not know that, and I didn't see. Didn't you? Oh, cool! Question. I wondered if you did know it. Ah, I, I great. Did. But um, well, it's it's completely free. Would... It's a completely free week. I'm going to have some travel bursaries to come over. Um, if you can afford to pay for it, do because I don't have. But everything in Bordeaux itself is completely free. So let us we we'd love to be a part of of helping make that happen. So that's a that's a conversation uh, we can do on the side. Okay, but, wonderful. Uh, and I'll we'd give you all the details of how to apply, and then we can put it up on the um on on the chat. Fantastic. Now we we we'd love to be a part of it and help, and even do some fun things to raise money for uh for that great cause. I think wine education and and particularly. Um, access to to some of the older vintages, be it Bordeaux or any place else, is yeah. is very very difficult. I agree. And, and can I? I just want one last thing on that is yeah, I think sure. that we all have the because Bordeaux can be such a kind of traditional. It's seen as being so so traditional. I think we can dismiss it, but I think it's really important for people who work in the wine industry to know if you know about Bordeaux. It gives you a shortcut to all kinds of expertise wherever you are in the world. Something I've noticed regularly is I go to a new wine region that I might know nothing about. And when I say I'm from Bordeaux, they assume I have a level of knowledge that gives me access to things. And that is, I think, a kind of a useful life hack, a shortcut to know about that I want to help other people know about that. So don't be put off thinking, oh, Bordeaux is too closed. I want to help people get that access. I'm gonna gonna have to spend a little more time in Bordeaux until I can put it on my resume now. Thank you for that hat. Um, 
So on the subject of things that are changing, we want to talk about tech. Um, and tech, obviously, tech and wine have been things that, that don't mix. Um, but like global warming, like the diversity and inclusion discussion, like um, any of the other kind of changes, globalization that are uh, increasingly, you know, thrusting themselves into, into the world of wine. Um, technology is, is playing a role there as well. Have you seen that awareness or that thinking uh, come in, or do you think people are sort of just still playing with it at the edges, uh, and it's it's sort of a a fad, but not really being taken seriously by the Bordelais, uh, at least by the trade and and the winemakers themselves so far? I I would say that um, sometimes you have to um, bring a lot of um, the Bordeaux trade kicking and screaming into the the, the kind of the, the real changes in the technology and the, and the possibilities today. For a smaller chateau, this is true world over, the problem is one of time, having the time mm -hmm. to actually look and see what's out there when there are so many other demands. Um, and for the big chateaus, sometimes it's again about this idea of entrenched power that they have that makes them mm -hmm. maybe not realize sometimes until too late what is happening outside of their own privileged kind of bubble and realizing that so many things are changing. But there is without a doubt a movement. And I, I know you will have discussed this amongst yourselves with, the, with what you're doing. The last two years have seen a huge speeding up because they've had to in all industries um, having to grapple with the possibilities of what you can do online, and all the rest of it. Um, I could pull, I could, we, we could chat about a few key things that have happened in Bordeaux in terms of crypto and, and NFTs in the last couple of years. Probably highest profile is Angelus. So Angelus um, last year issued an NFT that was connected to the 2000 barrel, I mean, sorry, 2020 barrel. So if you got the NFT, you had access to your own barrel of 2022. Sorry, <laughs> let me get this right, 2020. And with that also came I think it was a piece of digital artwork that was the bells. Yeah. It was something connected to the Angelus bells. I guess that was the highest profile to date. I've got to say, I think they probably could have done a better job of letting people know it was happening. I think maybe it was all kudos to them for being early adopters and moving. But I think there's so much more than that could be done. But what's worth noting about that one is that they linked an experience to it. So they linked an experience to the idea of buying that NFT. And as far as I'm concerned, and I'm sure you agree, that is the key going forward because the people who collect these wines, the mentality of collecting is not so different in any form of collecting. And so there's, there's a perfectly sensible and logical leap from being a wine collector to understanding how to do it in the new economy as you guys are living proof of. But, but I think with everything in luxury now, you wanna feel like you're getting an authentic experience and a genuine connection with what it is that you're buying. That's true in any kind of luxury goods today and, and NFTs will be no different. Absolutely. And the words that you're using are exactly the words that are the most important to us. It's, it's authenticity, it's experience, um, and it's the right technology is just an enabler at the end of the day. It, it, it either enables you to uh, go deeper, have a better experience, have it even more authentic, have it cheaper, faster, better somehow, but it's not tech for tech's sake that one would do it. And Funny enough, we, we were David and I were at Angelus talking to them about that very ah. barrel and that project. And um, what did they say? <laughs> well, it's interesting that they started with a barrel first rather than with bottles, right? Because yeah. it, it it's been a pain in the butt for them because this I was barrel gonna say, it probably wasn't the best thing for them to start with. It, well, I think I think they kept it quiet partly deliberately because it was a bit of an experiment and they've got this barrel on their property that somebody else owns and has an influence over how it's going to be vinified. And so it, it's just logistically all of the problems that we're trying to solve, like the ownership problem, how do you ensure that, right? It, it's on, it's on their property, but it owned, it's owned by somebody else. So it's, it's just these dozens of sort of 
pedantic to material things. Like, how do I actually vinify one barrel differently than I'm going to do everything else? And, you know, it, 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 it's sort of great idea at the time, but there was a whole ton of, you know. It's such a good point, because there's this big question about the ownership of, or they used to be, when on Prima first switched from being really about business to business within the trade, when it first switched to being consumer focused, there was exactly these questions came up. Who owns it? Yeah. There was yeah. a big fire in Orme de Pez, and I think it was the late, late 1980s, I think. And there was a fire which destroyed a lot yeah. of the um, Orme de Pez um, vintage which had been sold. And so the insurance company at first didn't want to pay for it because they said, well, it's not owned by you. It's owned by all the people who have, who have bought it around the world. And Orme de Pez successfully argued that that wasn't the case because they still had it in their care at the, at the chateau. And I think only 50% had been paid, not the final. So for whatever reason, Orme de Pez won. And that was like a test case, which showed actually the chateau still has ownership until the moment it leaves. But it's a really good question with that NFT because actually they bought the entire barrel in its entirety at that time. So it's a different legal question. So yeah, lots of things to work out. Indeed, and people have learned from that as well. So you know, Penfolds has done some a barrel barrel drop as well, but with all the kind of caveats in the fine print yeah. that you know, yeah. we're it, it's yours when it hits bottle, basically. Yeah, exactly. You're, but you're but right now. <laughs> barrel as, uh, but your your share of that barrel is going to come in the form of a number of bottles with NFTs attached, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so yeah, that let's let's then wrap with kind of your latest project, the book, and then the club, and how you person. What what excites you most about NFTs and and blockchain and its ability to kind of accomplish or accelerate some of the things that we've been talking about that democratization, that access, and that authenticity. If I grossly uh, lump them into into three categories so um for, in terms of the, the project that i'm working on right now and this is a big reason why i'm excited about this um i've written as i said before i think like six or seven books about bordeaux the most recent that was published was published two years ago that's a big kind of encyclopedia about bordeaux called inside bordeaux it's been, it's been fantastic but in terms of nfts i have my very first book that i wrote that was called Bordeaux Legends, and it was about, or it is about, how the five first growths became the five first growths. It was probably the single most important moment in my career is when I was thinking, you know, everybody wants to write a book. If you're a journalist, you're always, always desperate for that first book you can write. And I was looking around for a topic and I, and I just knew that this was a story that hadn't been told and should be told. Why these five? Why was it Mouton, Lafitte, Margot, etc.? And so I went to them and asked them if I could write it. And they said yes. And I, but I didn't have a publisher. And I started writing it and researching it without a publisher and found one halfway through. And the only people that I could find were beautiful, brilliant publishers in Paris. But they said, you've got to sell 2000 books before we agree to to on sign on the dotted line and at the time I was had no experience with selling at all but I was like I'm desperate to get this book published so I picked up the phone I called um, merchants all over the world and I've managed to sell those 2000 books and it really did change my career without a doubt and also it was a brilliant brilliant story I loved it I got Francis Ford Coppola to write the forward to it um, it went right from middle ages to today how they became it what their story was the coolest story about um, Baron Philippe de Rothschild spending 50 years trying to get Mouton promoted to being a first growth, etc. Anyway, it was it was great, but it was only ever had one print run. It, it was only 5,000 books printed and it had one print run, one in French, one in English. It sold out within about five months in the English version. The French version didn't, took longer. And so the French publishers never wanted to reprint it. On the mm. secondary market, that book went up to being about $3,000 within a couple of years. But as a content creator, I didn't touch any of that. I didn't kind of realize that in the way that Bordeaux Chateaus, when they you know, sell on their wines, they might reach many, many thousands on the secondary market, but they're not getting that money. Anyway, so the thing that I found interesting about NFTs from a content creator point of view was you in, within your smart contract, which I know we're not supposed to call that, that anymore, but within that idea when you're minting, 
as a content creator, you still get a bit of, of the, um, your royalty basically is built in. So that was exciting. And also this was a story that I knew could have gone further. It just was such a cool story. So I am reissuing this as an ebook with one of my friends who's a digital artist here, who's a guy called Ian Padgham, who is a genius. He's gonna do a very cool cover for it. So there'll be a beautiful piece of digital art that's connected to the first grace that will come with the book. And so that's gonna come out, as you guys know, in a couple of months time. Um, and that also made me start thinking about how else can NFTs be applied for wine? And I'm hoping, this may be completely naive of me, but I'm hoping that for the chateaus, they can see that maybe this is a way to keep their prices reasonable at on Primeur. One of the things we hate about on Primeur is the chateaus try and preload all of their profits right now. They want to take it all. If this can work, blockchains, NFTs, there is no reason why they can't price reasonably to begin with in the secure knowledge that they'll get their 5% or whatever that, whatever that percentage is as it goes out in the secondary market, gaining um, value as it goes. So that could be a win-win for wine collectors, wine lovers, and for the estates. I mean, who knows? But, you know, that's the kind of thing that I, I can see being exciting. That's actually one of the things that we are most uh, hopeful of as well. And not just through improved economics for the winemaker, but also through the combination of that and the transparency with what's really available, what's consumed and gone that it will just bring more rationality to the pricing on the market. More data should, but you know, there's as many case studies that will tell you that that, that data hasn't stopped uh, rampant speculation. Um, but our hope is, and it's, I mean, if you say in Bordeaux, it's, it's an issue in Burgundy, it's even much more oh, extreme, absolutely. right? Where the, the winemakers, you know, what a what a winemaker gets for a thousand dollar bottle x chateau is often a hundred and maybe a hundred and change so there you know the ability if if they could control pricing better by issuing a certain number or certain percentage of those bottles directly at at what they see as as the correct price or the price that they'd like to see in the market over time, that will will start to drive changes in behavior. And if so. it doesn't, they'll still make the money off the secondary trades anyway. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, that's an extreme correction that needs to be done. I actually think the case you brought up in Bordeaux is easier because that's a that's straight up a matter of trying to pre bake um, the margin take from whatever speculation they assume that the secondary market's gonna do. And you can entirely remove the incentive to do that through a premium attached to the NFT that goes back to the chateaus anyway. Yeah, yeah so, it is, it's super interesting. And that goes back to, you look at vintages like 20, 2008, which came out at a very low price because of the global financial crisis. But again, if you look at people who invested in the 2008, they did extremely well out of it because on the secondary market, there was a lot of value built in that wasn't realized at the time. And yeah. so you made a lot more money out of that than you did out of nine or 10. And so yeah. think about that in, time, in terms of NFTs. There's, yeah, there's a lot of potential. So let's maybe close on that topic. Wine is an investment and, and you're, you make your living in Bordeaux, uh, which is probably um the epicenter and and the longest sort of lived uh kind of wine marketplace uh that that still exists what how do you see and have you been seeing the world of investing in wine changing because wine over over the time span that you've been there wine funds have popped up to do this. You know, you've got the LiveXs of the world, which kind of create transparency and tradeability of all of that. You've had, you know, the explosion of Asia becoming the dominant market. Um, is there still room for another change for new entrants to come in? Is there space for NFTs and fractional ownership and, you know, what NFTs are doing to other tradable securities or things that are hard to get into? Do you think that there's space for that in, in Bordeaux as well? 
I think there's always space for clever, disruptive ideas which actually work. As long as they're really delivering value and delivering something tangible that we will benefit from as wine lovers and as a community and as people wanting to just have fun and exchange with each other. Because I think that's what we can forget about with wine investment globally is that idea that wine at its heart is, is genuine. It sounds like a cliche, but it's true. The people who make it are hoping that you'll sit down with your group of friends and open it and enjoy it. And, um, and that, that should be the aim of it. And I guess the problem with wine investment is it can, it can cloud all of those issues of the fact that at its heart, wine is made as a way to connect with people. And so you've got to hope that this new way of disrupting is actually more about bringing it back to the consumer. In theory, if you're doing the, the tasting tokens and all the rest of it, in theory, that's about trying to kind of record those experiences as opposed to the money that you're making. The funny thing is, we've spoken to a few negos um, who I expected would find this threatening and horrible and, you know, or just, uh, my God, technology, sucker bleu, no. Um, but actually, they've been surprisingly open to it. Um, and funny enough, I think it is that parallel with the opportunities that fractional ownership or the potential for more consumers and more entrants will has has brought to to other types of of, of investments uh, that that people are making. And I think you know, at its heart, it's just supply and demand. If you can increase demand for them, they're thrilled because. That should drive up price. It creates more customers for them, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I'm you and I both hope that it drives more rational behavior and where corrections are needed, it drives those corrections. But that doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, on premier average is is a hundred and it should be 80. That what it means is if they're speculating that it's might go up to 130 and they try to claim 125 from day one yep. and take that speculative inflation out and just let the market do its work. So I'm not necessarily arguing that prices should be lower. I'm, I'm arguing that it should be transparent and rational. And funnily enough, if you increase demand with fixed supply, yep. Yep. in fact, um, I would imagine that for the stuff that's really desirable, that transparency will will continue to help um, help the pricing. And if, I think it's very cool to think point. of this as being like that time in in the eighties, in nineteen eighty two, when you had a great vintage, but at the same time connected to that was Parker driving that. Well, Parker was just at the cusp; he wasn't driving it so much at that time. But the idea that that the public was coming in and having access to on primeur in a way that was completely revolutionary at the time. It is kind of cool to think that now we might be, well, we won't know for another couple of years, but we might be living through another seismic shift. Certainly we are living through a seismic shift in terms of what people want and expect from the luxury wines, or as we said before, the luxury brands that they're connecting to. I think nowadays people, if they're paying a lot of money for something, it's not good enough just to say, here you go we've got a load of history and you better like us because we know that we're great that's just not good enough anymore there's they have to find other ways to connect and be more authentic and it is yeah it's kind of interesting to that we might be living through a real revolution in that yeah we're super excited about it as well i'm gonna i'm gonna ask you one more question um and i, I promised to allow some q a so while i open it up for one question from the audience if there is one um, and please chime in if any if anybody has your questions, throw it in the Q and A or throw it in the chat to to Jane and I directly. Um, Jane, the, the the closing question I have for you is what personally, and and now I'm being very very personal. Like personally for you, what would you most like to see and do with this tech? I mean, you can sell your book on the platform. You can do the NFTs. You can you know, collect your tasting tokens, you can um, publish and with, with more trends, you can, you can do whatever you want. And we've talked a ton about all the stuff that you can do. What, what one thing excites you the most? Um, 
I, I'm, I, don't know, I don't know if it's going to work. The thing that I like, when you came to talk to me about what you were specifically doing, the thing that I liked and projected myself forward 10 years was the idea of, because all of us do a lot of, well, before COVID and hopefully now again, traveling, meeting up with friends in different parts of the world. And maybe there are people that you only see four times a year, but that you're so happy when you see them, but you don't see them again because they don't live down the road. I love that idea that potentially this can give you kind of like a breadcrumb trail of what of what you drank with them and, and what you were doing with them that night that you can then look back on in the future. That's what we're kind of, you know, potentially with the tasting tokens, you could be sitting down. I was in Singapore two weeks ago, first actual travel and tasting that I had done for two years, that was the opening of 67 Pall Mall with Richard, who I know is a fellow yeah. member. Um, and I was sitting with him and, and a good friend of mine from school who lives out in Singapore. And I, and I was just thinking if we had, you know, some way of recording what it was that we were drinking and then we meet up again in 10 years time, we can look back. I like that idea that you can actually make it a, a, a nice way to, to track your friendships. That's, um... I, I, it almost makes you wish you could fast forward 10 years and see this stuff. <laughs> yeah, it's, just, it's, it's kind of cool though, because just like wine, just, just like the, the 2020 vintage, we're going to have to wait a couple of decades to see what it, it really does. So I think that's, it's only fair enough. Yeah. Brilliant. That brings us exactly to the hour. Um, <laughs> thanks a million for the time. Really appreciate it. Uh, I'm sorry I won't be able to catch you in Bordeaux this time around. Um, but uh, I really sure look soon. forward to the next conversation that we have. And that one is going to be about wine critics and wine. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, well, have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Jane. Take care. Speak to you soon. Take care. Bye. Bye.